Hello again, my name is Tom Irvine, and I'm the instructor for this series of shock and vibration webinar units. And once again, I'd like to thank Dr. Curtis Larson and the NASA Engineering and Safety Center, NESC, for making this series of webinars possible. Today we're going to be covering digital filtering. And as an added bonus, we're also going to take a look at some seismology as well. And it might seem kind of odd to study seismology in a presentation sponsored by NASA, but let's just think for a minute. Suppose there's a payload on a Delta II rocket that's being launched out of Vandenberg, California. Well, that launch vehicle and its payload mounted, as mounted on the pad at Vandenberg have to withstand potential earthquake excitation from the San Andreas Fault, which is nearby. So, so the, this rocket and its payload is this tall cantilever beam subjected to base excitation, and analysis is required accordingly for potential earthquake events. Plus, it's good just to have some cross-training as well. So filtering is a tool for resolving signals. And filtering can be performed on either the analog or digital signal. Well, today we're just going to be focusing mainly on digital signals, but I do want to mention a little bit about analog filters. And filters can be used for a number of purpose, purposes. So let's say we have an analog signal from an accelerometer or some other sensor. As a good engineering practice, we would route that signal through an analog low-pass filter prior to the analog to digital conversion. And the reason we would do that is to prevent an error source called an aliasing error. And this is an error whereby the high frequency energy, uh, spectral components in other words, are folded about the Nyquist frequency and deposited at the lower frequencies, uh, thus appearing the given the appearance that the energy at lower frequencies is higher than it really is. Well, in a previous webinar unit, we went over Nyquist frequencies and sample rates and, and aliasing, so uh, I'll let you uh, refer back to the previous unit uh, to get more information on that. Uh, but I will say quickly that uh, the cutoff frequency for the analog low-pass filter should be less than one-half of the sample rate fr frequency. And again, uh, specific uh, rules of thumb are available uh, in the previous webinar unit that discussed uh, sampling the Nyquist frequencies and aliasing. So another uh, purpose that we could have for filtering, for, and this will be now for digital filtering, is we, could keep, we, want, we may wish to clarify the resonant behavior uh, within a signal by attenuating the energy at frequencies away from that resonance. That could be a bandpass filter, for example. We'll, we'll talk about bandpass filtering here, filtering here shortly. Um, let's see. So we're going to cover some practical ex applications and example in this unit, and we're going to be talking about a time domain filter, which is a, a digital Butterworth filter, or I should say, we're going to be discussing how to implement a digital Butterworth filter in the time domain. And we are going to do this using a, a digital recursive equation. And in order to do that, we need to uh, derive the filter coefficients. And we have to consider uh, Laplace transforms and partial fraction expansion and Z transforms. And I've got a paper on my blog that uh, goes through all those steps that you can read at your leisure uh, as a homework assignment. OK. So there's different ways we can characterize filters. Um, there are some filters that are high-pass filters and others that are low-pass filters, for example. So a high-pass filter is a filter which allows the high-frequency energy to pass through. And it is thus used to remove or attenuate the low-frequency energy from the signal. And conversely, a low-pass filter is a filter which allows the low-frequency energy to pass through and it attenuates the high frequency energy from a signal. Now we can also uh, construct a bandpass filter by using a high pass filter and a low pass filter in series. And we'll do that later on. Now we can also uh, characterize the filters uh, in, in terms of the filter type. And a Butterworth filter is one of several common infinite impulse response or IIR filters. 
And this group also includes Bessel and Chebyshev filters. And, and these, these filters have feedback loops. And that's important for stability. And the Butterworth filter can be used for either high pass, low pass, or band pass filtering. And it is characterized by its cutoff frequency. And the cutoff frequency for a Butterworth filter is the frequency at which the corresponding transfer function magnitude is minus 3 dB, which is equivalent to a magnitude scale of 0 0.707. We'll take a look at the transfer functions here shortly. Now, a Butterworth filter is also characterized by its order. And a six-order Butterworth filter is the filter that we're going to be using in this webinar unit. And it's a good all-around general purpose filter. Now, one of the properties of these Butterworth filters is that the transfer magnitude is minus 3 dB at the cutoff frequency, regardless of the order. But other types of filters, such as Bessel, do not share this characteristic. And we'll look at uh, some transfer functions for Butterworth filters in an upcoming slide, or slides, I should say. But let's start. Let's look at a uh, low-pass filter. It's going to be a six-order Butterworth filter, and it will have a cutoff frequency of 100 hertz. Let's take a look at its transfer function. So this transfer function here, it's a magnitude and phase plot. And there's two subplots, and as you can see, they're both functions of frequency and hertz along their respective x-axes. The upper one is, well, first I should duly note, Butterworth low-pass filter, six-order, FC means cutoff frequency, equals 100 hertz. And one of our concerns with this filter is that the phase angle varies with frequency. And then about 80 5 hertz or so, thereabouts, well, let's make that 75 hertz, okay, about 75 hertz or so, there's a sort of a wraparound effect that occurs, so if we plot from minus 180 to 180 degrees, there's a jump that occurs, but we're, 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 we have some concern about that phase, the potential phase distortion that's going to occur. Uh, it, if we have some steady state stationary broadband random vibration signal, and we're filtering it, phase distortion is probably OK. But if we have a, a transient signal, then the phase distortion could be a problem. Now, we're going to find a, we're going, we're going to cover, I should say, cover a method for correcting for phase distortion. That'll, that'll be in an upcoming slide. Let's take a look at the magnitude here for this 100 hertz low pass filter. So we start off with a unity gain. And that unity gain goes out to uh, uh, somewhere around 75 to 80 hertz. Uh, we see a roll-off effect start to occur. So here's the roll-off. And then this cutoff frequency point, which is at 100 hertz, has a magnitude of minus 3 dB, which is equivalent to 0 0.707. Now, an ideal filter would be just a flat plateau, clear out to 100 hertz, with a shear wall vertical drop off. And wouldn't that be ideal? Well, it turns out if we try and construct that filter, we get numerical instability. And that's just a fancy way for saying that our filtered signal would just blow up. <laughs> we get some crazy high values. So we have to, for practical purposes, accept this limitation. And the consequence is we're going to filter out some, uh, some of the energy uh, close to 100 hertz, or I should say leading up to 100 hertz. We're going to sacrifice a little bit of that energy, and we're going to retain some of the energy above 100 hertz. Well, uh, just keep in mind also that this is a log-log plot. <laughs> so this would look different, obviously, if it's linear, linear. Now, again, this is a six-order filter. Well, if we went to higher order, then, then this plateau would, would extend a little further before the drop-off, and the drop-off would be a sharper slope. Well, the problem is, as we go to higher and higher orders, we're more likely to encounter numerical instability. So I like to use six-order just as a good general purpose filter. 
Okay, let's go to the MATLAB GUI package here. So I'm going to let me just type in vibration data to call up our GUI package. And we're up to version 5.3 and rising. So we're going to have a time domain uh, input, time history input. And we're going to go to filters various. We'll begin our signal analysis. And we're going to do a Butterworth filter. Now, this script applies a six order Butterworth filter to a time history. The input array must have two columns, time and seconds and amplitude. Well, even before uh, we call in our time history, we can, we can do a few extra things with this, uh, with this particular uh, function here. And we can, just, we can display what the transfer function is. So I'm going to put in 100 hertz. This will be a low pass filter. Uh, for now, we'll do no phase correction. We will cover phase correction shortly, but not right now. So let's calculate. No, we're not going to calculate the response. That would be for a time domain input. Let's display the transfer function. Okay, we get uh, a couple of plots that show up here. Well, actually a pair of plots. This first plot is the, uh, the transfer function in terms of real and imaginary components. And we're not going to be so interested in, in this one here. Rather, we're going to look at the equivalent magnitude and phase. Well, the equivalent magnitude and phase, you've already seen this on the, uh, the PowerPoint slide. But I'm just uh, showing you how, to, how I calculated those curves. Uh, so that if you ever want to put in your own filter parameters, uh, you can calculate what that transfer function would be. Would be. So let's just uh, minimize this for now. And we'll park this off to the side. Well, let's, 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 let's don't park it off to the side quite yet. Let's do a 100 hertz high pass filter. So again, Butterworth six order, 100 hertz, high pass filter, phase correction, no. Let's display the transfer function. OK, the real and imaginary, we're going to ignore. OK, here's what we get. It's, it's the same transfer function as before, except instead of low pass, now we have high pass. But the cutoff frequency remains 100 hertz. And this is a six order filter. So in this case, you can see we have this sort of a ramp effect that occurs. Then the ramp kind of rolls into a plateau there. So we are going to retain a portion of the energy below 100 hertz. And we are going to attenuate a slight amount of energy above 100 hertz. But, but again, due to the practical uh, considerations of numerical stability, um, this is what we need to do. <laughs> That's what we're going to do anyways. OK, let's, let's do one, one other. Let's do a, a band pass filter. So this is going to be a high pass filter and a low pass filter in series. Let's go from 100 to 200 hertz. That difference there is a, is a one octave step. Okay, let's ignore uh, real and imaginary, and let's just go to the uh, magnitude and phase here. So Butterworth bandpass filter, six order, 100 to 200 hertz. Well, ideally, I guess you'd call this the pass band. Ideally, within the pass band from 100 to 200 hertz, there would be a flat plateau with unity gain. But again, we have some uh, practical considerations. So we do retain some energy below 100 hertz. We do attenuate some energy there uh, slightly above 100 hertz. And, and similarly uh, for the 200 hertz uh, case. And we do still have uh, some phase distortion effects going on. Well, this, for practical purposes, this is what we would do, the transfer function we would have if we were trying to filter between 100 and 200 hertz. And the, the, the numbers we enter here did not necessarily have to be a one octave separation. I just did that uh, for, uh, I guess I thought it'd be a good case to look at for convenience. OK, this, this plot here, this is actually a Butterworth low pass filter. And the cutoff frequency uh, for convenience is set to 1 radians per second. And this is showing three different orders. So the L equals the order. So we could have a, the blue curve here 
That's a second order. The red curve is a fourth order. And then the black curve is a sixth order. So again, each of these three curves, regardless of order, passes through the same minus 3 dB point at the cutoff frequency. And you can also see that by increasing the order, we come closer to meeting the ideal of an ideal filter, which would have a flat plateau out to 100 hertz and then a shear wall drop off. But, but, but the trade-off, and I, I, have, I have not demonstrated this to you, but just uh, for now, I guess, take my word for it. The higher we increase the order and the, and the closer we meet the ideal filter, the more likely we are to have numerical instability. And you'll find that to, when we actually get around to filtering a signal using the MATLAB GUI package, the vibration data GUI package, one of the outputs that will appear in the command window is an assessment of the filter stability. Okay, so you might think, okay, we have those transfer functions in the frequency domain, either the magnitude phase or the equivalent real and imaginary. So how about if we, we take the Fourier transform of the input time history, we'll multiply that input Fourier transform by the filter transfer function in its complex form. Then we'll take the resultant Fourier transform and we'll take its inverse and that will give us our filtered time history in the time domain. And that would actually be a valid approach, um, but we don't use it uh, for a couple of reasons. One is the time domain method is more computationally efficient. And also when, when, we, when we go about doing our Fourier transforms, there are some uh, error sources that we could encounter like a leakage error, for example. So that's why those are some of the reasons we favor doing this filtering in the time domain. So what we're going to do is, let, let's say we take our transfer function and we'll represent it by h as a function of omega. So imagine taking the time domain equivalent of that transfer function, which will be a, a digital recursive uh, refiltering relationship. And we're going to take x sub k, that's our input time domain signal and go through the uh, digital recursive filtering process and then we'll get our output signal in the, t in the time domain. So this is what we need to do. And to do that, we're going to come up with a filtering equation. Well, here's the, our implementation of our digital recursive filtering relationship. So let's allow x to be our input time history and y will be our output time history and k will be a, a time index. So what we're going to have is this formula here is shown on the right. Now, in these uh, curly brackets here, there are two sets of terms. So the first set of terms, and L is the filter order. So we have B sub n. These are the coefficients that get multiplied against the time history input points, and then there's the summation is shown here. And in order to calculate those coefficients, we need to refer to the methods that I have on a paper uh, posted on my blog for this, for this webinar unit. Now the second term, we have minus, and then the second term here, this is the recursion part of the filtering. So the A sub n are the coefficients for, for the recursive uh, term. So recursion is just a fancy way of saying that the response at any given time point depends in part on the responses at previous time points. And this is, this is the feedback loop. This is why our filter is going to be an infinite impulse response filter. And that feedback, feedback loop is desirable for stability. Now, ideally, a filter should provide linear phase response. And this is particularly desirable if we have a transient signal or if we're doing a shock response spectrum calculation. Well, the problem, as we've seen, is that Butterworth filters do not have a linear phase response. And other infinite impulse response filters share this problem. 
Uh, however, there are a number of methods available to correct the phase response. And the method I'm going to show you is, is something I would have never thought of on my own. <laughs> but, but it works, and it's, it's very uh, innovative. So I, I credit whoever invented this. And what we're going to do is take our time history, and we're going to uh, play it backwards. So we're going to reverse our time history. And if this were a live course I, I was teaching, I'd uh, make some jokes about uh, uh, encoded messages in uh, popular music and rock songs like uh, Stairway to Heaven or, or, or Beatles Abbey Road or if, you know, Paul is Dead or something like that. But uh, anyways, you get the idea. Some of you are probably too young to know about that music. So anyways, we re reverse the time history. We, we play it into our, our, our digital recursive filtering relationship, which is the time domain equivalent of the transfer function. Now this intermediate output time history, we, we, we reverse it. So now the time history is pointing in the correct direction. And then we filter it one more time. So we call this refiltering for phase correction. Now a consequence of this is that it, will, it, it changes the response at the cutoff frequency from minus 3 dB to minus 6 dB. Well, let's see how that works. So I'm going to go back to our uh, GUI package here. Go to Butterworth filter. And let's do something we've done before. We, we've already done a 100 hertz low pass filter, but this time I'm going to turn on the refiltering for phase correction. So let's take a look here. OK. Um, OK, plot four is just showing the real and imaginary. Well, the blue curve is the real, and the imaginary is the green, but the imaginary component goes to zero. And I should mention this is the amplitude versus frequency in hertz. Now, here's the, the same transfer function, but in terms of magnitude and phase. In this case, the phase angle is zero across all the frequencies. Our magnitude is shown here. We have unity gain. Then we have a roll off. Well, this minus 3 dB point, which was minus 0, well, which was 0 0.707 before, has now dropped to 0 0.5, which is minus 6 dB. So that's what happens when we refilter for phase correction for our Butterworth filter. OK, so, th well, this slide just essentially shows what I demonstrated in MATLAB. Butterworth low pass filter, six order, refiltering, cutoff frequency 100 hertz, phase angle, magnitude. Each is a function of frequency in hertz. And here you can see at 100 hertz, this curve is going through the point at 0 0.5, which is the minus 6 dB point. OK, now we're going to have some fun. <laughs> and if this were a live course, I would ask I would ask my students, OK, does everyone here have a work-related hobby? So if you're an electrical engineer, do you also have your ham radio license? Or if you're uh, uh, work, working in the aerospace industry, do you fly uh, remote control planes or go out and launch uh, uh, model rockets or something like that? <laughs> so at one time, I built a homemade seismometer and recorded some earthquake data. And we're going to play around with this data, and it's kind of a fun way to, to explore filtering. So the flag there uh, is from the Solomon Islands. And there was an earthquake of magnitude 6.8 that occurred near the Solomon Islands on October 8, 2004. That's about 10 years ago. And I measured this data uh, using my homemade seismometer. And at the time, I was living in Mesa, Arizona. Well. Now I'm living in Madison, Alabama, close to Huntsville. Uh, but that's where I lived. And I was able to record this data. And I was particularly interested in finding the onset of the P wave, which is the primary wave, within that seismic data. In order to do that, I had to do some filtering. So I'm going to just show you a couple slides here of what this uh, seismometer looked like. And it's called a Lehman seismometer. And Lehman is the name of a gentleman who uh, published a diagram and, 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 uh, for this type of seismometer, actually built one himself, 
and, and recorded some data. And then, and, and then in a, uh, a scientific uh, type magazine or journal, he, he uh, presented his results. Well, uh, I, I suppose if you uh, go online, you can find some company that will sell you a Lehman seismometer. But kind of the spirit of a Lehman seismometer is you just go out to the garage and you just scrounge around uh, with odds and ends uh, pieces of hardware and you make your own. So that's that's the true spirit. And uh, my my, uh, my machine uh, machine machinery abilities are 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 very rudimentary, but uh, somehow I was able to uh, cobble together one of these uh, seismometers and. And having said that, I, I had few, if any, if very few of these parts already in my garage. I, I, I made numerous trips to the hard, hardware store and uh, ordered uh, parts from uh, McMaster Car <laughs> uh, to, 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 to make one of these. But anyways, this is, it, it operates like a horizontal swinging gate. So this is a horizontal pendulum boom. And, and the idea is that the pendulum boom remains stationary in its own inertial space while, while the ground below is, is shaking. And then there's a sensor that uh, then measures the relative displacement uh, fr fr from the sensor itself to, to a little uh, target, metallic target that's on the boom. I'll, I'll show you some additional slides. So this will become uh, much more clear. But, but uh, just a few highlights here. There's a chisel bait blade here that butts up against a, a chrome polished bolt. And that's the pivot point. Then there's a wire rope cable that comes down from this frame with a little turnbuckle to, to adjust the, the tension. And then there's a, a ballast mass, mass here that's partially, partially submerged in a pan of oil uh, to provide damping. Okay, here is the sensor. And this is a, a non-contact displacement transducer. So there's actually an air gap from the sensor head to this metallic target. And in the sensor, it, it does not measure absolute displacement. Rather, it measures relative displacement. And I, I did not have this calibrated uh, in any particular unit. So the results I, that I obtained were uh, unscaled relative displacement. And I think this is some kind of a linear variable induction transducer or, or some such thing. I actually ordered it from the Omega company. And here is just another view. You can see the sensor here with its little air gap and the, the metallic target. And then here's the ballast mass made from lead, partially submerged in this pan of oil. And I've got a few other miscellaneous pieces of uh, hardware uh, hanging off this. And that was because I, I went through a whole uh, iteration of various transducers before I, I could find one that would give uh, good results. And in fact, the classic Lehman seismometer would actually have an uh, electromagnetic coil uh, that would, uh, that would uh, vibrate or oscillate back and forth between the poles of a magnet, and, and, then, and then the resulting current in that coil would be uh, proportional to velocity of the coil. Well, I tried that, and I could not get it to work. But I was able to, uh, to use this uh, relative displacement sensor and get some, some, some good readings. So I, I, I was happy. Uh, here is the chisel blade, and it butts up against the chrome polished uh, bolt. Okay, now this is not an earthquake. This is unscaled relative displacement. So the fact that you see plus and minus five there uh, doesn't mean anything. But this is relative displacement versus time. And what I did is I gave the, the pendulum boom an initial displacement and then let, let it undergo free vibration. Now, this is not a perfect uh, uh, single degree of freedom response, but, but if with, with a little bit of imagination, we'll say, that yes, this is a single degree of freedom response. And the frequency was so low that it's more convenient to represent, represent it in terms of the equivalent period, which is 14.2 seconds. And then the damping was 9.8%. Uh, 
and that and that's a good damping value. And the period of 14.2 seconds is reasonable. An ideal period would be much longer. But but the problem is with this uh, with this whole setup is that this is very delicate and requires required a great deal of uh, tender loving care. And, and and due to all sorts of things, due to uh, changes in room temperature, due to due to ground vibration from uh, uh, from cars driving in the out in the street, or footfall vibration within the home, or who knows all different other sources, this this pendulum had had a tendency to to swing either to the right or to the left until uh, till it reached a hard stop. In, in fact, this little Frame here was was designed to 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 stop the uh, uh, the, the pendulum boom, uh, but between uh, the, between certain uh, relative displacement limits. Well, again, this this thing required a daily adjustment, and if I if I had made the I, I if I had constructed this so it had a longer period, then it would have, would have become even more likely to become unstable. So there's a trade-off between uh, stability and, and period, and I suppose if I had this in some underground bunker, uh, kept at a constant pressure, constant temperature, isolated from, uh, well, we can't isolate it, can we? But if I had it in a, in a more idealized uh, room or, or something like that, then, then it would have had better performance. But, but this was good enough. So here's the data acquisition system I had. A uh, beautiful system. It was uh, uh, made by Nicolay, and Nicolay has been bought and sold, and I think uh, that company really doesn't exist anymore, and, and its product line has been discontinued. But uh, there's another company called High Techniques that's uh, picked up their engineers and technology that has a similar system available. And this is the first earthquake I recorded, and it was from that Solomon Islands earthquake. And you can see the uh, the time history there, uh, the, the the yellow uh, time history on on the screen of that Nicolay system. And here here is I'll call this the raw data. So this is the Lehman seismometer, the horizontal response to the Solomon Island earthquake, date and time duly noted. We have the relative displacement along the y-axis, time in seconds along the x-axis. And the seismic wave has various uh, components to it. The P, the P wave, the primary wave. The S wave, also known as the secondary or shear wave. The LQ is the love wave. And then there's also a Rayleigh wave. And there's also different uh, uh, for, forms, uh, be, be, which, which you have to remember or, or know about these waveforms is that uh, some of these waves propagate through the center of the Earth, through the body of the Earth. Other waveforms propagate along the surface of the Earth. And, and as those waveforms, uh, particularly the body waves, uh, reflect and, re, and re, reflect, re, refract uh, across the various layers of the Earth, uh, one, way, one, one, one type of waveform may transform into another type of waveform. And it gets very complicated in some of these later uh, arriving waveforms. That they may be a waveform that's, that's undergone three or four or five or six different uh, transformations. Well, I, I adjusted this data, or I wanted to adjust it. My goal was to adjust it so that the earthquake occurred at time zero at the Solomon Islands. Now, in order for the P wave to travel from the Solomon Islands to my home in Mesa, Arizona, that required about seven or eight hundred seconds worth of time, and, and I was able to calculate that calculate that using some online tools uh, provided by the U.S. Geological Survey. But if you look at this data, you'd see well, the the onset of that S wave is is, is quite clear. But but the but the onset of that P wave is kind of ambiguous, and you can see there's quite a bit of noise occurring before that P wave. In fact, just looking at this, it's hard to say that this little bulge is really a P wave at all. Well, wh wh why is there noise? Well, obviously there's some instrumentation noise that's inevitable, 
But we also have to remember that the Earth itself is always vibrating. It's in a state of constant vibration, seismic vibration, but the vast majority of this vibration is uh, imperceptible to the human senses. And, and that, that, that daily vibration, it, it occurs for various reasons. Uh, there's the, the, the gravitational interactions between this, the sun, the earth, and the moon. There, there, there are tidal effects. There's winds. Uh, th th there are mid-oceanic ridges where there's an upwelling of, of magma that's driving tectonic plates. So the earth is always vibrating. And that's why you, s you, you can see some uh, uh, vibration occurring before that P wave was to arrive at my home in, in Mesa, Arizona. So I had to be sure that there really was a P wave. And I went through some trial and error process. And let, let me just, uh, let's just do this in, in MATLAB here. This is good practice. So we're going to take a time history and we're going to filter it. We're going to have a Butterworth filter. And we're going to call up the data. It's going to be an external ASCII file. This is available at my blog. It's sm.txt. Uh, Y-axis unscaled relative displacement. We're actually going to do a high pass filter. Let's do 0 0.2 hertz. Since this is a transient signal, or we're looking for a transient signal, let's go ahead and use our phase correction, a refiltering for phase correction. Um, let's just go ahead and calculate the response. So we have unscaled relative displacement versus time in seconds. And if we high pass filter at 0 0.2 hertz, we can see there is a distinct onset of that P wave. And that gives us confidence that we have adjusted the, the time scale so that time zero is the time that the earthquake actually occurred. That's when it originated. And then the P wave took 700 seconds, or well, it's about 700 sec 750 seconds or so. Uh, to reach my home in Mesa, Arizona. Okay, so this is actually the, the input data here. So this is the S wave, the distinct uh, spectral, excuse me, the distinct transit, that's the S wave. And this little bulge here was the P wave, but by high pass filtering, we, we were able to determine that that just wasn't any ordinary bulge. It was, in fact, the onset of the P wave. So let's see. Let's get back to our slides here. And then this is the same uh, filtered results. Uh, and I, I've, uh, I've applied the letters P and S there uh, to show the, the two different waveforms. Now, I had this uh, seismometer set up. And it really required a lot of tender, loving care, as I mentioned. It took a lot of fine tuning and adjustment. And I was able to capture maybe about four or so earthquakes. So I was pretty uh, happy with myself. And, um, and at that point, the system went offline because I, I got busy with other things. Well, what happened when I took my system offline? Well, that's when the big one hit. The uh, 2004, the Sumatra earthquake hit, uh, the Indonesian, Malaysia, and uh, that part of the world. And it uh, generated uh, tsunamis that uh, uh, sadly uh, killed quite a few people. So I missed the big one. Just like a fisherman story there. Uh, just some information. There's, we can divide seismic waves into two different types. There's body waves and surface waves. And the body waves have a shorter period with a higher natural frequency. The surface waves have a longer period with a, with a shorter natural frequency. And that comes from a, a seismology textbook. And actually, I'm just, as, as I'm, I'm scratching my head here, natural frequency uh, implies maybe the response of a structure. So I'm not sure if natural is the correct adjective or not. Uh, maybe I should have just said uh, frequency here. I have to think about that a bit. Now, I've, I've been talking about P waves, so you're probably wondering, what is a P wave? 
And, and the best way to think of a P wave is structural born sound. So the structural born sound wave propagates and there are alternate bands of uh, compression and, uh, well, I'm just going to say the stretching. <laughs> I don't know how to pronounce that word. So, so, so we get this compression and stretching as, as the, as the waveform uh, propagates along. So, so think about like a slinky, taking a slinky in, in your hands and if you could hold it horizontally and you're moving, you know, say from right to left or left, left to right, and you have, you have that uh, slinky stretched a bit, and you're, you're, you're exciting it uh, so, so that the alternate uh, the stretching and compression occurs. Now, now another characteristic about these P waves is that they can, they can go through air, they can go through water, liquids, they can go through granite or solid material. And it's also the fastest of the four common waveforms. That's why it's the first one that we're looking for, the first one to arrive at my home seismom seismology station. So that's, that, that's the P wave. Then the S wave or shear wave, or S could be for secondary wave, it's, it's another type of, of body wave. And in this case, you, you see that the, uh, the displacement is occurring perpendicular to the direction of propagation. So the S wave produces an amplitude disturbance that is, that is at right angles to the direction of propagation. Now water cannot support a shear force, and this is a shearing action. So S waves do not propagate through water. And that's actually very advantageous for seismologists because if a major earthquake happens in, in say China, that can be recorded by seismic stations uh, in the United States or anywhere else on the in the world. And seismologists use these, these seismic body waves to essentially x-ray the Earth. And what they've concluded is that the Earth must have a partially molten core because those P waves can propagate right through that core, but the S waves cannot. So the S wave energy uh, just reflects off that core. So that's how, that's maybe the major reason, or at least one of several reasons, that uh, geologists have concluded that the Earth has a partially molten core. I guess made up of some iron and nickel. Now the love wave is, is a, it's a shearing horizontal wave, and it propagates along the surface of the Earth, and it cannot go through water, so it can only go through solid material. So that's the love wave. Nothing to do with romance. Uh, uh, love was the name of a seismologist who uh, characterized th these waveforms. Then we have the Rayleigh wave. Now, a Rayleigh wave is also a surface wave, and it can go through either land or sea. And it's, it's, it's very much like an ocean wave. Just think of a rolling ocean wave uh, coming into shore. But Unlike the ocean wave, this motion is retrograde. So we have these uh, counterclockwise spinning circles as the waveform propagates. Whereas with an ocean wave, it, we would have a prograde waveform. So we'd have a clockwise rotation as we propagate uh, from left to right. So that's kind of an interesting effect. One of the things I ask my students in the, in the live course is, if you're an earthquake engineer and you have to design a tall building to withstand an earthquake, or if you have to, uh, if you're concerned about a, a Delta II or uh, some other launch vehicle going out of Vandenberg that uh, has to withstand an earthquake while it's during that two-week period while it's on the launch pad, so so if if you're in either of those two scenarios, which of these two waveforms are you most concerned with? P wave. Shear wave, love wave, or Rayleigh wave? Well, it turns out it's the two surface waves, the two waves that propagate along the surface of the Earth that can cause the, the most uh, potential damage to a tall building or launch vehicle. So it, imagine a, t a tall cantilever beam here. So this love wave would, would shake that, that, that cantilever beam 
uh, in the axis that's uh, uh, perpendicular to this slide. Or you could say the axis that's out of plane with this slide. The love wave, now imagine a, a, a tall cantilever beam mounted on the on, on, on to the ground, and a Rayleigh wave comes along. Well, that's going to cause that tall cantilever beam to have a vibration that's in plane with this slide. So it's the love wave and the Rayleigh wave that are of most concern to earthquake engineers. So what we've done so far in this unit is we've uh, talked about filters and we threw in some seismology because it's a good way uh, to learn about filtering in terms of filtering as a practical application. And let's go ahead and just uh, finish off by, uh, okay, so let's, let's finish off by going to vibration data. So let's go to vibration data blog. And let's just type in filtering here in the search box. So webinar 19, that's the one we've just covered. And I've got the PowerPoint slides there, the data file for the Solomon Island earthquake. And then here's a reference paper. And this has the explanation of the uh, derivation of those filtering coefficients that are needed uh, to perform the filtering. And I just thought of one other thing that I meant to show you later on, earlier, I should say. When we, when we filter, when we use our MATLAB GUI script to use our Butterworth six order filter, there, there's some uh, uh, printouts here. And usually these won't really be very important to you, but they could be. There's the A coefficients, the B coefficients. And then I have some information about stability. And for this particular case, we had three stages. We had good stability for each of the three stages. So our output filtered signal was a stable signal. So sometimes you might see, if, if you have a, a borderline case, you might see marginally stable or marginally unstable, or you might see something that's completely unstable. And, and that has to do with the, 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 the sample rate, the Nyquist frequency, and the filtering, uh, the cutoff frequency. And, 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 and just, just to, as a quick uh, little guideline, anytime we select our filtering frequencies, they should be less than the Nyquist frequency. And the Nyquist frequency is one half the sample rate. So that about wraps it up for this unit. We're actually going to cover digital filtering in the next unit as well because there are some other uses of it for it. So I hope you've enjoyed this unit, and uh, we'll talk to you later. So thank you, and goodbye.